everyone. I'm going to go ahead and get started. First of all, thank you all so much for being here. <laughs> no, it wasn't easy for everyone. We had, you know, a bit of a bit of a, a snowflake or two this morning, but it didn't stop us from from getting in here. We've got Craig Boring from Craig Borum from Ply Architecture, who came all the way from Michigan, and so w canceling this event was was not in the cards for us. We wanted to, to make sure to keep this going despite the bad weather. So I wanted to thank each and every one of you and also to thank all of our sponsors. You'll see on your tabletops a listing of all the sponsors from 2014. We are working on sponsorships for 2015 and so we hope that by next month we will have a new listing with an updated list of sponsors that reflects the new year. And give you a little bit of an update on a, an event we just had recently, the UT Career Fair. This is an opportunity for UT students to talk with professionals. We had over 40 firms participate. This was an opportunity for students to ask questions about, hey, I don't know what questions to ask in an interview. I don't understand, uh, you know, all the things I'm supposed to do. So they get interaction with professionals, and professionals also get that valuable interaction with students. And from what I understand, there are many UT students who are seeking summer internships. So if anybody catches wind of that, please contact Michael Senna, who's the AIAS president. And I want to go ahead and just go through a, a listing of a few of our upcoming events. Tomorrow, also sort of barring the weather, we, we think this is still happening. And uh, it's Architects Day on the Hill in Nashville. That's our opportunity to talk to legislators. Um, March 1st through 7th is Task Week with the University of Tennessee, and I believe we have some students here who can come up and run us through those events. This is a very exciting week for them. Come on up. Thank you. And tell me your name. I'm Jennifer Wynn. Okay, thank you. Uh, do I count? Let me help you with it. <laughs> there we go. Hi everyone, thank you for this time. Um, I'm Jennifer Wynn, task director of this year, and we have a lot going on um, in this coming week. We're, we always kick it off with kickball. Can I get a show of hands of how many of you guys are UT alumni? So we're all familiar with kickball for TAS, and so we're doing that um, this year, this coming Saturday at Sequoia Hills. We're still trying to get a lot of um, alumni to join us for kickball. Um, we have all of our teams, um, forms for the year. So there's three first year teams who are very eager to meet local alumni and local professionals to play against them. So please join us for that. And then we also have um, workshops and lectures throughout the week. And we would like for you guys to join, uh, join us for that too. And then also we're going to end it with Beaux Arts Ball at Relics Variety Theater. And I know a lot of you guys are familiar with that because of Pacha Kucha. I hope I said that right. Um, but it's a beautiful, beautiful place, so I hope that you guys can join us for that, too. Um, I might have just ran through all of that too quickly, but um, there's also a lot of organizations without, within our college, um, such as CSI, Freedom by Design. They're all holding some sort of workshop on Wednesday. So throughout their week, there's always something going on. Um, area Architecture is coming to lecture on Monday. So all of these events will have calendars sent out via email um, somehow. I don't know what the AIA email is, but we'll have that forward to you guys, calendars, to, to keep you guys updated. So everything is for free, so please join us. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. We hope for lots of participation from professionals. That's what makes it happen. Uh, the next thing coming up is Grassroots Leadership and Legislative Conference in Washington, D.C. That's March 4th through 6th. That's coming up real soon. We've got several of our board members who are planning to go. Um, we'll give you a report of what we learned and what we found uh, at the next chapter meeting. Another event coming up March 10th, CSI of Knoxville is having a building product show at the Crown Plaza. Like I said, that's March the 10th. It'll be from 4 to 8 p.m. Go ahead and put that on your calendar. You should have gotten a notification about that, and we'll be sending out one more reminder for that, too. Um, the next chapter meeting, March 24th, will be at, back at the Foundry. Hope you all have enjoyed this buffet style, and I hope it worked out, but I think most of us do prefer the, the, the arrangement at the Foundry. We like to change it up every once in a while, but that's where we are next month, and we will be hearing from Ashley Cates and Britt Ragsdale as a report on the state of the state AIA, and they will also 
it will be timely and that it will be uh, directly following our day on the hill. Let's see. April 10th, there is a energy code seminar that is put on by, uh, in conjunction with us, the USGBC, the AGC, and ASHRAE. That will be at 8 a.m. to 1 p.m. here at the Southern Depot. It's a seminar and roundtable discussion um, that helps us all understand the 2012 energy codes and how they apply to us in East Tennessee. Uh, April 13th through 17th is Architecture Week. Matthew de Bartleben, uh, along with Richard Foster, are working feverishly to get ready for that. They're putting together uh, lots of ideas for events to involve the community, to involve students, to try to educate everyone in Knoxville about what it is that an architect does, what they should be expecting of their architects, and, and how we can contribute to each and everyone's lives and, and our community. And then we will be having April 28th is our chapter meeting, which will also be at the Foundry. That will be our joint meeting with AGC. We'll go back to the round table discussion format for that meeting. And then a big exciting thing, the AIA National Convention, May 14th through 16th, will be in Atlanta this year. The keynote speaker is Bill Clinton, which should be really exciting. And, and registration for that is, is open, so you can go ahead and get online and register for that. Also, the other convention that we get excited about, which is especially important to us this year, is the state convention, which will be here in Knoxville. John Sanders and Greg Campbell have been working hard, and I have been promised that there is a phenomenal lineup of events that will be unfolded in an exciting manner. You won't, you won't hear about all of it at once, but you know, John will start pulling things out of his pockets and, and letting us know what's coming up. Uh, we'll be planning in August the ARE Structural Seminar. We will be planning on organizing a grant for UT. We will be having our golf tournament as usual, and we will be planning our East Tennessee Design Awards in October as usual. And I think that wraps up our announcements. At this point, I would like to, to get Jason Young to tell us a little bit about our speaker. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Um, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Jason Young. I'm the new director of the School of Architecture at UT, so it's great to be here. I was at your event in the fall, the award ceremony, and found just a really amazing convivial group. Um, it was really impressive. The level of functionality and pleasure of that event was, um, was a joy to be a part of. So it's great to be back here, and it's great to a great honor to, to introduce to you Craig Borum, who's a old friend of mine from University of Michigan, where I came uh, recently from uh, Ann Arbor down to Knoxville. And I've known Craig, uh, it's been a long time, maybe 16, 17 years, uh, as colleagues, um, <clears throat> competitors at times um, for clients. And uh, anyway, it's great, it's great to have him here. I'll tell you a little bit about him because he's got uh, quite an impressive uh <clears throat> um, background. So Craig's a, Craig's a full professor at the University of Michigan in the Taubman College of Architecture and Urban Planning and is the founding principal of Ply Architecture in Ann Arbor. Um, <clears throat> through Ply, they do quite a range of work um, from large-scale institutional commercial projects to private residences to furniture and lighting and, and recently some kind of planning and environmental studies. So, uh, Craig founded Ply in 1999, and since that time, uh, the firm has been widely published and has consistently been an award-winning firm. So, for example, he has one Huron Valley AIA Award, which is the sort of sister organization, uh, the regional organization in Southeast Michigan, um, to yours, the sister to yours. Um, but then, I think, moved on and uh, uh, to the state level, where he has seven Michigan uh, AIA Honor Awards. He has won National AIA Honor Award for a project. He's a 2006 Young Architects Award uh, winner. That's sponsored by the Architecture League of New York. And in 2007, I love this one, Wallpaper Magazine out of the, uh, out of the, uh, out of the UK um, wrote Ply as one of the world's 101 most interesting new architects. So um, quite an honor for, from an international journal. So. In 2010, Craig, uh, through a project, won the, won the Architecture Magazine R&D Award. And in 2011, an AR&D Award for Emerging Architecture. 
So his work employs an uh, inventive use of common materials. Um, he often explores construction systems uh, in his work, and um, he's committed to responding to site and circumstance and the local condition, but also um, has deep roots in the discipline where his commitment is to geometry and the use of materiality in a special way. So he's a kind of, I, I think of him as an architect's architect, really someone to, to learn from. The work that he does is wide in scope in the sense that um, it's both diverse in project type, but also the kind of engagement that he does is diverse as well. Grant funded research, um, international competitions, and, and commissioned projects. And so just to give you a sense of um, the role of the research, and, and I'm sure Craig's gonna show some, um, and really how he approaches it. In, in a recent project called Storm Glass, uh, which, in, which uh, the, the project involves the development of a new building enclosure system that both indexes changes in the weather and, and also telegraphs the change in those patterns two days in advance. It's a kind of technological research that he's done. That project then informs commissions that he has and impressively goes forward into these venues. So from that project, he has a 2011 Architecture Magazine R&D Award. Uh, an award from the Chicago Anthenaeum, um, American Architecture Award from them in the same year, and a citation from uh, Architect Magazine, uh, the 59th uh, Annual PA Awards. So he has a citation for that Stormfront project. So uh, educated at UVA, he has a Master of Architecture from 1996 in Virginia. He's a native of Virginia. Um, he did his undergrad at Virginia as well. And then he worked for, it seems like, five or six years or so before returning to graduate school. When he graduated um, with his Master of Architecture, he, he was awarded by the faculty the AIA Gold Medal and the Certificate of Merit. So um, accolades from, from, uh, from way back. I think, on a personal note, I think it's an, a very interesting time to intersect with Craig and his work. He's at a, a, a pretty ripe moment in his career where he's spreading the deck, as it were, working uh, more and more on product design, lighting, table, furniture, at the same time that he's expanding into large um, projects in China through international competition. So he's become in Ann Arbor the go-to architect for renovating mid-century uh, modern uh, houses, which in Ann Arbor in Southeast Michigan, there's quite a, an amazing stock of, of those buildings, and he's sort of like the authority on that. So. He's at a really kind of um, vibrant moment where there's a, there's a lot going on at Ply. There's a lot going on for Craig, and I think it's going to be a real pleasure to, to, to have him share his work with us. So help me welcome Craig to Knoxville. <clears throat> well, thanks, Jason. That was a um, great and super detailed and thorough introduction. <laughs> But uh, I really appreciate it. Thanks a lot. I also want to thank um, uh, John Thurman, who I think Jason worked with to get me down here, uh, and uh, Robin McAdoo for um, hosting us today, and all of you guys for braving the weather uh, to get out here. Um, uh, you know, for us, uh, th this kind of weather in a day like today would just be Tuesday. Uh, <coughs> So I, but I understand, I'm from the south, so I understand what a kind of snow like this means to um, uh, what it can do to your day and your work week, and I really appreciate a lot you're, you're making it out. <coughs> so I'm going to show pretty much a, a, the, the cross-spectrum of what Jason talked about, working from uh, talking about, uh, really for me, what, what the quote on here tries to uh, articulate, which is, um, for me, I've never really, like, position, even though I've, like, my, the, the birth and growth of my practice coincides with my role as a teacher at University of Michigan, I never, I never really tried to draw distinctions between those worlds. It was always, for me, one thing that I was doing. And I've always liked this sketch um, by Charles Ames, which I think the official title is, uh, This is a House. For me, it's really like, this is an architect. Because um, I think it, it really, um, it really can describe, I think, the fullness of what we do as a discipline. We don't just um, go to an office and work on drawings and uh, show up on the job site and, and kind of work with contractors. And um, but we're we're thinking about um, uh, we're thinking about a wide array of stuff, and we do it through play, we do it through movies, we do it through music, uh, we do it through painting, 
Uh, we do it through shaking a cocktail shaker, one of my favorite moments there. Um, uh, and I, I think it's a real fullness about life. And, and the, the, for me, it's always been about um, sort of thinking about how we exist in the world and taking those experiences and folding them into the way we work as architects. And for my practice, um, you know, starting out as a, a junior faculty member right out of, um, right out of grad school, um, sort of li literally left grad school, got in the car and drove uh, at Virginia and drove to Michigan and showed up teaching. Starting a practice was a difficult thing. And so the, the foundation of the practice was really, a, um, I don't know, a, a, a kind of interesting story for me, which um, starting a practice without any work is probably not the easiest thing to imagine. But we started doing some competitions. Uh, and as part of that, um, because, because competitions for us became a way to think about scales that we couldn't think about otherwise, doing, doing kinds of building types that we would not have been allowed to even uh, be considered after the first question on the RFP, which is how many other schools have you done and what was, you know, how did you meet the budget and like, what, you know, all of those kinds of questions. With, without that kind of background, there was no way to really, uh, I think in the, in the U.S., to engage in that kind of work without either going to work for a firm that was doing that work and building your experience through that ladder, um, which I think is a great way to do it. And, uh, but for me as a teacher, that was not, not part of the possibility. But I've never really thought about the possibility of being a teacher without practice. And I've never really thought about practicing without being a teacher. They were just uh, two inseparable. So, that, so it, it presented some problems, and those problems actually always, you know, you sort of turn into opportunities. So for me, we. We started, uh, I started thinking uh, first uh, on my own, but then quickly with uh, a number of people participating. Started to imagine a way that we could engage in competitions uh, as speculative work, but do it and, and try to go after those competitions, which are always ones that were intended to be built. We were always hoping that it would, it would lead to something um, uh, constructed. But we would do them not worrying about that part of it, but trying to figure out how can, we, how can we ask a bunch of questions that we could take on maybe four or five competitions in a row and try to explore something. Um, and so the, the first projects, and, and we were really, really good at second place. I mean, say we, like, we, we nailed second place. Um, uh, we, uh, we did a, uh, the, the thing being, like coming from Virginia and going to Michigan, one of the things about Michigan I think that impresses you is the scale of industry, the scale of the landscape, and the impact that those things have, um, just the working ethic, the, the kind of relationship of industry and production and factory, the, the, that world of factory production has on you, and you really start to um, recognize that in the built world once you're, you're kind of around. So we decided uh, in a really simple way to take on some, some prefabricated building systems pre-engineered steel buildings. They were everywhere. Uh, you, couldn't, you, you couldn't drive five minutes in any direction from Ann Arbor and not hit uh, a Butler building. Right? Um, and, and they're really simple buildings. They're actually really cheap. And so we use that as a kind of way, like what, what can we do with it? How do we understand it? How can we work with the logics of it? How can we distort them? How can we reinvent through them? We did the same thing with um, insulated precast uh, concrete systems. And then we, we engaged a modular house factory uh, and, and began to explore within the logics of their system, where was their room for design to operate? And that led to an, a number of projects, just to, to kind of um, uh, to touch on that, a, a, a church uh, for, for a, a kind of steel frame building, uh, <coughs> um, a, a two school competitions, which we, were, we felt like both of those we, we actually really should have won. Uh, we were, we were right on the, the kind of edge of that. Um, uh, uh, and for us, very important projects, because I think they positioned uh, a, a both a kind of larger civic interest in our work, uh, and uh, also we were exploring a kind of technological area um, related to tectonics. Um, uh, so just a couple of images of those. I'm not going to go too far into those projects, but just set that up as kind of like, this is, we started working at a kind of scale, or an aspiration for scale, but it's taken us, it's taken me a lot longer to kind of get back to that scale. Um, because it, as we were sitting in an arbor and working, other things started to pop up, smaller projects uh, that we engaged just as intently and just as ambitiously in terms of our thinking, but they were nonetheless quite small and all quite materially intensive. So small detailing projects. One was literally for a sunscreen uh, at the architecture school. 
We got the budget that they were going to uh, spend on mini blinds to cover a south facing wall uh, that was providing too much glare on a new computer cluster. Uh, and they literally said, uh, we're going to spend this on the mini blinds if you can do something, uh, you got that money. Uh, so we invented a, a kind of way of using new technology at the time. This was probably uh, 12 years ago. We just got a CNC router uh, and we were exploring it. And the image is a little bit washed out, but I'll show a couple more images of it. We were playing uh, with plywood and trying to get plywood to glow, um, trying to use the south facing glass exposure uh, to illuminate the plywood by how we manipulated it, but also solve the problem of glare. Another one was literally a, a kind of decorative surface that we were exploring, just, just taking the same concept of the router, and then trying to figure out how to, how to get past the plywood limitation and, and started using the same technique to make our own formwork for larger scale installations for a project that we finally got, uh, we finally won a, a plaza uh, in Detroit. Um, and, and in this work, that, I mean, it was kind of interesting. We, we began to call this kind of body of work kind of uh, the architecture of half an inch because it felt like everything we were doing was about half an inch thick uh, in terms of uh, uh, how we were trying to invest in the ways of making. But th those early projects, um, one, uh, a, you know, a number of restaurant interiors, one after the other, um, we got lucky because we were, <coughs> I don't, I, I know exactly how we stepped into this. My partner at the time was dating one of the waitresses and, um, uh, uh, you know, we were young junior faculty and really trying to get the practice going. So teaching all day and then showing up at, the st at our office at night working and that we were eating out pretty much every meal of the day. So we, we got to know a lot of people in the restaurant industry. Um, just just by uh, showing up enough, you know, um, and, and every conversation is, yeah, we design things, yeah, we design things, uh, and then finally they were like, okay, we got it, we need to do something over here. So we 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 got them. We the school purchased this machine, crazy big CNC router at the time. It was kind of like an unwieldy and unimaginable thing about how we would work with it, and we we jumped into it. And I think we did a lot of the the pretty rookie mistakes that you kind of do with that, which is like make things with like a thousand different parts all unique and you end up throwing away at least half of the material you start with. Uh, and we started to get critical of that. This, this, this is a, a cash counter uh, at a sushi restaurant <coughs> made of vertically grained plywood, really kind of um, simple stuff. Uh, uh, but in the end, I think produced a pretty great effect. But uh, on the side here, what you see are the, the, plywood, the plywood sheets, the four by eight sheets that we bought for that. The yellow stuff that's remaining is the stuff that was thrown away. We didn't have a design fee for this. We just had a fee. They were like, here, you build that thing, this much money, whatever we had left over from our own work is what we got to keep. And we realized like at the end of that, we threw away half of our material budget just straight into the dumpster. And that really started to get us thinking both about the economy of the thing, but also a kind of larger sort of um, trying to be critical about the things we were building and the tools we were making. The brother of the owner of that restaurant was opening a new one, hired us to do one in the, a neighboring town, uh, and we wanted the exact same thing, and we said, well, we don't want to do the exact same thing twice. Um, uh, so we, we, it was a much smaller space anyway, but we tried to invent a way to, to maximize the use of the, the plywood in this piece. Uh, we had a much better efficiency, uh, a, a solid 10% more utilization uh, on the, the plywood. But we started, in, in that, we just started inventing new projects in the edges of the plywood and the, and the pieces. So uh, this, which is really, um, the lighting is, is kind of dim for us, but it's a, a wooden cylinder light fixture that we developed as a product for the restaurant uh, that we used. That um, the, the plywood is cut thin enough and when it's oiled, the grain of the plywood, the alternate layers act as kind of fiber optic um, transmitters of the light inside. So it gets this really beautiful glow. Uh, those sunscreens we were working with was really just, um, th these projects were just learning the tools, learning what we had at our disposal and how to, how to let that inform the design decisions that we were making uh, and open up new categories for us to expand. What for us was the, the kind of scope of practice. It allowed us to also, um, I think, in, uh, expand our engagement with the projects. As small as they were, we were becoming, our contra we were becoming contractors ourselves. Uh, uh, and, and that sort of hands-on and kind of working, I think, gave us a new way uh, of both talking to contractors when we were working with them because we had a level of experience to build on. 
but they also gave us a really great appreciation for the process of building uh, and the difficulty of, of executing some of the things that we can so easily draw, uh, even at a, at a super small scale. Uh, and the, and the, the depth of thinking that you have to go through in terms of detailing a project. Uh, so in this case, uh, the difference in the articulation of the surface is just whether we used a round head bit or a flat head bit and how far we, we broke the surface of the plywood. Uh, uh, it's, it's hard to see, but these kind of orange areas uh, are where the, the lights, we were basically taking the router bit all the way to the, to the back layer of plywood and letting light come through. <coughs> uh, and, and practice, I think you probably most know, is, is kind of a random experience. So one day two guys showed up in the office because they went to the building department and said uh, the building department told them they needed a stamp to renovate the little takeout restaurant they had just uh, bought. They just wanted to change a counter. We happened to be the in the phone book, the architects closest to them. Uh, they came in and said, we just, we, can you stamp this drawing for redoing the counter? And we didn't have anything going on at the moment, so we said, oh, just sit here for a second. Well, let's show you a couple things. So we showed them a, a whole bunch of work, and by the end, they said, well, here's our budget for the restaurant. Um, if, if you guys will do it for that little, you can do whatever you want. And we were like, mm. <laughs> all right, uh, we'll do that. But, I mean, but I'll also say the restaurant, the, literally the space is nine feet wide by 13 feet deep. And then there's a fry kitchen right behind that. Uh, it's basically takeout burritos open till 4 a.m. right at the end of the fraternity strip where. Um, so we thought we'd kind of play with some of the, the uh, optical effects of like imagining that 4 a.m. drunken walk in needing some carbs uh, and see what we could do. Um, so and, and for the budget we had, we basically wrapped the room with plywood. Uh, we, we used a red uh, fin ply uh, and then used the router that we were playing with. Um, so every time we broke the surface, you know, it produced, you know, it just got to the raw wood. And, and, uh, and we started thinking like from the dot patterns we were playing with and the other pieces, the beginning to think about almost like a calligraphy, um, uh, uh, thinking about the way we draw and draw lines and, uh, and just using lines as a kind of language uh, to work the surface. And in a nine by 13 room, how do we make multiple rooms uh, uh, feel like they're present? And then how do we also hide some of the other things, like the lines, sometimes when they, bu when they were bunching together, it was where we poked through and let the light fixtures come down, uh, or uh, uh, we let the lines actually dig through the plywood and uh, air diffusers uh, were basically hidden behind that. And we, you know, we did all the work to calculate the, the CFMs and kind of get the, the correct openings in order to deliver the right balance of the air in the room. But we were trying to embed all that into what was literally a quarter inch of work, um, half inch plywood. And, and we were working that plywood uh, literally to within a quarter inch of its life, I think. Um, and, and these projects, I think for us, were, were both fun. Uh, we, we built this, we did it in a week. Uh, we literally spring break, uh, uh, basically like it hit and we, we just basically, the whole office just kind of showed up at this burrito restaurant and we just kind of wrapped the whole space and, uh, and did it. And, it was both rewarding uh, in the way that some projects take forever to kind of play out, but it was also a kind of fun one to execute because it was like we got, we got the kind of immediate gratification of, of doing something, doing it that quickly. And, and for us, the speed was important too because the budget was so small and we w wanted, we're always trying, even though we knew that this wasn't ultimately the practice, in every aspect of the project, we were trying to find ways to build new levels of efficiency or new levels of working or techniques that would allow us to imagine the scaling of this work into uh, another arena. And, and that, 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 that actually was a pretty difficult and took us quite a while, I think, to begin to get to that point we were thinking about it. Um, the cash wrap, which I showed the one image of before, is um, uh, literally we just, we did a really shallow topography within the plywood. Uh, and this was our favorite moment because you could watch the kind of drunk undergrads walking in and they're like looking at that counter as they're waiting. <laughs> and they're wobbling a bit. And, uh, you know, it was, uh, I don't know, it was just a kind of fun and, and playful experiment that, um, that got us, uh, I think, a, a, a kind of interesting level of work out of it. At the same time, we, you know, with, with um, uh, we, we were teachers, so we were basically funneling uh, any project back in through the practice. So. Uh, we were using anything that we, we made on the previous project to fund the kind of experiments or research that we were doing in the next project. 
in this case, uh, trying to shift that, like, of just consuming plywood um, continuously for projects to beginning to think about plywood as a reusable thing, a, a formwork, or, or different ways of thinking about materiality uh, and, uh, and the, the consumption of that material in the process. Um, uh, and these were, these were just, like, in the back of our, uh, our space. Uh, we were just literally playing with formwork and trying to build up a kind of attitude of modularity that built on the kind of tiling pattern which those topographies, the, the only rule about those topographies is where um, uh, the profile of the topography as it hits the edge of the tile uh, has to match, has to always be the same, but then what happens in the middle of the tile can be whatever, and then they join and it produces a smooth surface. So we were trying to think about that in relationship to concrete and kind of shifting our scales and how to, how to again, build a kind of efficiency and scalability into the work. And then we won a, a competition um, uh, in Detroit for uh, a plaza at Mies van der Rohe's Lafayette Park. Um, and the, the project, Mies, the, the Mies project is kind of in the trees over here. Uh, this is a shopping complex uh, at the foot of a Mies tower, which the photograph is taken from. Uh, and then the, the, the plaza that is being redeveloped here. These are not by Mies. Uh, they're done kind of in the style of the, the Mies townhomes that are uh, adjacent. Uh, the project for us was a, um, uh, they gave us a 10 foot by 10 foot area here. The, the competition brief to do memorial to Mies van der Rohe. The, uh, the developer had a kind of, um, I don't know, felt like he was, uh, uh, had a kind of architectural appreciation of Mies um, uh, and wanted to do something to, to acknowledge that. He, they gave us the kind of site drawings as part of the competition. What we realized when we, we went to the site and checked it out is they were rebuilding that whole plaza not just a little 10 by 10 thing. And they were just going to do two big surface drains with uh, uh, herringbone brick stamped concrete uh, and then a couple of um, off-the-shelf benches kind of thrown in for people to sit under a couple of trees that they had budgeted for as their landscape budget. And what we did as a competition, because we, we figured, well, you know, we're really good at second place, so let's not worry about winning anymore. Let's just keep going for second. Um, because, <laughs> you, know, you know, when you're getting good at something, you like to keep, you know, keep it going. Uh, but, but we said we'll take over the whole plaza. We'll take the, we won't take the budget for the 10 by 10, we'll take your budget for the whole plaza and we want to do something. But, but it's a plaza so it was just a surface which also fit perfectly I think in our mindset at the time which is uh, architecture of half an inch. Um, we got it to about six inches in this one uh, by the time you take the whole slab into account. But we, we designed a surface um, that distributed, uh, the idea was to build on, on the, tr the legacy and tradition of Mies. So taking the kind of insistency of the grid, but trying to uh, update it a little bit. Um, this is our, our site plan. Uh, there's a stair at one end that we had to um, uh, incorporate. We took the four trees and made a very small cluster uh, at one end right by the trees so that you had to walk around those trees and into the plaza. Uh, and then we designed a tile system um, uh, that, w that was trying to also integrate a, a kind of idea about the landscape and the distribution of stormwater on that plaza into the, the entire surface. Rather than the kind of purity of the perfectly horizontal flat slab of Mies and hiding all of that system underneath, like at the Farnsworth house, uh, we said we'd collapse those two things together. But today you can't, you can't hide that work anymore. You have, to, you have to acknowledge and render transparent these systems. I think to, to participate in that conversation that everyone's becoming more aware about, which is how architecture and the built environment um, engages those natural systems. So for us, the, um, we took that, that the tile, which was a four by four tile that was already established in the geometry of the plaza, uh, and we took one corner of our tile and, and pulled it in, uh, and then we, in section, we also pulled it down. So it basically makes a kind of, makes a kind of funnel to one corner um, and, and we can arrange the tiles in any number of ways that then allowed planting bids to emerge and the planting bids were created basically in the center of catchment areas that the tiles produced as a, as a pattern. Uh, these are some of the drawings we produced that were describing the topographic kind of arrangement, but also we were playing with some early versions of kind of trying to script some things and, and track rainwater, a raindrop as it hit at any point, where would it go? And, and began to uh, study that as a kind of um, low maintenance landscape that we could develop uh, versus just throwing all that stuff right into the, to the Detroit stormwater system. 
Uh, and we were inspired by, uh, by other folks like the Ames and uh, particularly the film Blacktop, which probably some of you have seen or, or hope, well, if you haven't, it's a great little film, which is just um, water moving across the uh, elementary school blacktop uh, after they're washing it down, uh, set to um, some music by Brock, uh, by um, uh, Brock. Um, pretty beautiful um, and subtle. But you, you get the kind of um, power, I think, of those, those subtle moments and a close observation gives you. Um, <coughs> we, we were true to our, our kind of effort and we proposed that we would make the formwork for the tiles, kind of building that, um, that research, the kind of self-generated research that we were doing just as kind of play. And we had a timeline that the general contractor for the whole plaza developed in terms of like uh, when he needed the tiles uh, in order to place them after the subsurface and in order to keep the, the critical path of the whole project moving. I think we had like 18 days and we had 180 tiles to produce. Uh, the factory we were working with, um, a huge uh, precast factory uh, in Michigan, um, the, the vibrating bed that they were casting on was basically the size of our office uh, uh, that we were in at the time. Uh, and, and we did basically the math that said if we had, uh, we needed 180 tiles and we had 180 days, they said they could do one tile a day, cast it in the morning, by the afternoon pick it and lift it on the truck. Uh, once they were all in the truck, they'd drive it to the site. So we, we, that gave us 10 forms that we had to work with and 10 forms gave us uh, variability of 10 different tiles that then we could use as a kind of modularity in order to produce what seemed like a random array uh, but the whole field is made up of, of literally 10 variants of tiles. It's actually five because we book matched. Um, so there's a, a left and a right of each tile so that we could play with that, you know, Mises classic book matching of marble as we develop the surface. Uh, it's in construction. I think I always show this image because I think you can see there the, the profile of that leading edge where they're laying it down uh, of uh, what basically goes from a four inch slab to a two inch slab uh, of the tile. Uh, as it as it catches the water, and then uh, uh, an image of that plaza right after rainfall, and you can really begin to see the kind of pattern of mo of water moving across the surface, uh, and the planting uh, has finally kind of grown in. Uh, it's actually a, a pretty beautiful uh, landscape now. Um, the other aspect of it is we we eliminated all the benches too, and we set the the front height of the plaza at exactly seating height, and that's where you would kind of wait if you were, you were catching the shuttle bus or, the, um, uh, or getting picked up in the parking lot. Uh, so we, we were basically like trying to turn the plaza itself into the bench. And these things, uh, of course, all of this work was affecting what we were doing in school and what we were doing in studios was kind of feeding uh, this at the same time. Um, we did a number of studios where we were playing with um, uh, precast concrete modules uh, this one we did as a visiting studio, um, my partner and I at the time. Uh, uh, and it, uh, we, were, we were basically working with a kind of um, uh, the variability that modularity could produce, how to play with seriality or, or kind of iterative patterning, uh, but also uh, using a straight module that could produce uh, uh, kind of variations. And then playing with uh, this, uh, like how to, how to develop ways of casting. In this case, it's, it's a two-part cast that makes the module. Uh, so you're seeing actually the, the students were also learning how to use things like the CNC router as, as part of the course is just the straight pedagogy of it. Um, uh, and then, um, you know, they're producing at full scale. The same thing we're doing in the office. We're asking our students to engage and do. In this case, it's, it's actually, there's only one tile, uh, one uh, module shape. But depending on how you rotate it or position it or upside down or, or backwards, they always join with the, the next one perfectly but it even allows it to kind of turn the corner in a kind of graceful way where you start to get lines of, uh, of the profiles starting to wrap the corner just in terms of how you begin to manipulate the, the actual form or the, the, the unit. Uh, th that work, um, and I'll try to speed up a little bit, but that work was, was also leading us away from, uh, again, thinking about the big and heavy stuff and trying to get back into a kind of different level of efficiency. Um, we were trying to minimize the amount of time we were spending on digital machines and trying to, to work in uh, a kind of combination, trying to develop hybrid approaches versus always relying on uh, high technology, whether it was available or not. Uh, and in this case, uh, a, a restaurant following the, the kind of first burrito restaurant, which was a huge hit, uh, they opened another one uh, and 
uh, we got that project and um, uh, a completely different kind of space, much bigger, it was 110 feet deep in this one. Uh, we didn't even have the budget for this one to wrap the thing in plywood. We had to figure out a way to do something even, even smaller because at a like kind of super small scale, the plywood was cheap, but once it was 110 foot deep space, the plywood kind of immediately eclipsed the budget because you know, these guys were thinking, well, we only paid that for that restaurant. Why do we have to pay, you know, 10 times more for this one? And they're like, well, it's 10 times bigger. Uh, <laughs> but you know, sometimes those, th th those kinds of math don't always work, even though I always think of those guys as the business-minded people. You know, uh, cause we, we for sure aren't. Um, uh, so we were playing with, with things like expandable surfaces, like how do, we, how do we develop something that we could pack down really small or use a minimal amount of material and stretch it uh, and in this case, develop the ceiling. Uh, this is a reflective ceiling plan on one side. And we were also kind of fascinated by the depth of space. And we were trying to, it was kind of like this crazy um, tunnel effect that it got. Uh, and we were trying to find ways of kind of um, visually manipulating the depth. Uh, so doing a kind of tighter pattern right at the front door, letting it get bigger in the distance so that that, that conceptual depth started to collapse. Uh, and we were also um, trying to hide all of the other stuff that was up above still, the sprinklers, the uh, HVAC, uh, the lighting even, like uh, basically trying to bury that stuff and produce a kind of uh, smooth surface. So in the end, uh, our final, the, that middle row of stuff here, these are, this is the entire um, uh, material, uh, each component of the ceiling for the 110 foot space. Uh, that middle row, these kind of S-shaped pieces were the only thing that we had uh, digitally fabricated and they, they produce a kind of shift in the ceiling. The rest basically we just laid out with a chop saw, got the length right and then hand drilled, uh, pre-drilled pre a number of rivet holes uh, that we, uh, we, we had three strips that went together. You rivet one end, you have the holes preset for the other. The middle strip stays straight, and the outer two strips you just basically pull in, pop the rivet in, pull the next one and pop the rivet in to, to pre-drilled holes, uh, and basically produce this, uh, a unit of this expanded mesh. That whole 110 foot ceiling fit in the back of the truck, uh, pickup truck I had at the time. Um, a great truck, I uh, should never have sold it. Um, uh, and then we installed it, I think literally in, in like a day and a half. Uh, it, was, it was like, we, were, we felt like we were, we were actually doing what we were talking about for once. We were learning from our own uh, efforts and, and our own mistakes uh, and trying to expand that, uh, the kind of rationales and the logics that were, that were building the work. Um, uh, and the ceiling just makes, uh, because of the reflectivity, it's, it's all um, aluminum, uh, brushed aluminum. Um, uh, because of that reflective quality, the whole thing actually became the kind of light fixture, the way the light bounced around. Uh, it turned out, I think, pretty great. Uh, and those, those logics were, you know, we were, we were constantly, I think at the time, playing back and forth between small things we were doing by hand. I was super interested in, in that sheet, uh, like working with sheet materials. In this case, I, I was thinking about uh, playing with veneers, but doing all these tests with uh, paper um, and just finding ways that, uh, to manipulate the size and geometry of cuts in the paper in order to get a, a, almost like a truss surface developing between the between two shells, uh, two shell surfaces, uh, and develop the uh, basically a, a kind of pattern of, uh, uh, of paper making that became a whole series of, of surfaces and light fixtures that we were playing with um, that stayed paper. We, we've never kind of gone back to the veneer uh, kind of question, but. Um, uh, have become a series of lamps which we uh, still make and produce uh, uh, and sell. We, we uh, also took the kind of experiments and applied the kind of digital logics to them. So in this case, uh, my partner was um, uh, pretty deep into thinking about parametric modeling and CATIA. And so we developed a, a, a kind of base model for the light fixture um, that with stretch one of the circles or you stretch its height, all the part systems of that light get updated automatically and you still, you, you just basically send the file to the laser cutter. Now we use a CNC knife cutter. Um, uh, but so these two lamps are literally from the same digital file without any work other than us stretching it uh, and playing with the, where it pinches in and, and doesn't. But, and that was literally like a toggle, like you could just pull and grab 
there was no effort. Uh, the, the program was basically doing the work for us to produce uh, variability in the parts that the, that the machine could produce. Uh, so, uh, in fact, every light in that image is, is literally the same digital file um, uh, that then is frozen at a certain moment and output uh, a different part set. Uh, it was kind of fun. This was an exhibit in LA that we put together at the time. So, so the, that, uh, and again, I'm going to try to now start to scale the, the work back up uh, because it, it was kind of fun to start at a certain level and frustrating for us to start at a kind of medium scale of uh, trying to engage a public realm or a kind of um, a civic space in architecture and uh, basically drill that all the way down to something as, as kind of um, uh, product-like as a light fixture that sat on a table. Um, uh, and, then, and then at the same time, we were finally starting to, I think, gain some traction in Ann Arbor and getting some clients, small house renovations. Uh, this was a little ranch house uh, on the edge of town. Uh, we completely uh, gutted, we completely um, uh, resided uh, and in, uh, inserted a new uh, porch piece. Uh, and then we even began to work on the landscape. Uh, we were also a small screen porch, which was just playing with pressure treated decking. Uh, and the kind of patterns that decking makes, uh, uh, making a little uh, vortex on the back of a house uh, to an actual house that we were able to, to land the commission for. Um, uh, and, the, and the scales, uh, I think the scales and the efforts aren't completely commensurate here because we were, I think, just in the heat of it and just kind of playing, playing with materials at one scale and getting the commission at another scale and the pressures of those two things uh, didn't necessarily align. So I think some of the, the architectural um, scaled work was in, in many ways still quite conventional in terms of how we were both producing it and imagining it and conceptualizing it. Um, still uh, intensely invested in design, but, but not quite the same kinds of investigations we were doing at a material scale. Um, we had a project that was to do in addition to this uh, 1840s house. Uh, and the client worked for Google, who was uh, um, in Ann Arbor at a kind of small uh, moment, kind of early in Google's history. Uh, we'd, uh, we'd done all the research on the property. It was actually perfectly zoned for four units, uh, uh, multifamily zone, the size of the lot. The house was really small, but and we were telling them, you know, we should really, you should really begin to think about developing the property. Uh, all they wanted to do was an addition, uh, a small bedroom and bath addition. Um, and then uh, he got transferred to San Francisco um, with Google. Uh, I remember the meeting very distinctly, you know, they came to the office and they said, well, the project's dead, we're selling the house. Um, we're just, we just want you to package up the drawings so that we can show them to prospective buyers. Uh, and we were like, oh man, that sucks, how much? Uh, uh, and actually my, my partner ended up buying the, the house and property. He still lives in the, um, in the old house and we built the addition as a residential unit, but it was our office for about seven years and designed with uh, basically a full um, living unit on the upper floor and what is a garage, which for us was our shop uh, on the lower floor under that carport. <laughs> and then the house uh, and project kind of make a kind of public space on the backside. Uh, and there were a whole set of constraints about developing this, which were, were useful, but now it, it, um, uh, uh, the, our office has moved out of there um, uh, and it's now a residential unit again, but it was, it was us finding a way, again, of being resourceful and, uh, and in some ways kind of always uh, trying to invent our practice rather than waiting for it to come to us. We were trying to find ways of kind of making it happen um, uh, rather than just sitting there staring at the phone. Uh, and then, uh, as Jason mentioned lately, I've become, uh, uh, through, a, through a course that I was teaching, I was using the uh, archives of a former, uh, our former dean, Robert Metcalf, who did about 50 really beautiful mid-century modern jewel boxes around Ann Arbor. And I was using those to teach a building systems course because his drawings were super thorough. So the students were using those drawings to understand uh, through construction drawings, the integration of systems, and they were producing digital models and, uh, and then reinventing those houses through contemporary sets of questions. Uh, uh, I, I think the, one of the archive librarians um, uh, there who we had always introduced the collection to the students was approached by someone who just bought one of his houses um, uh, 
uh, and asked, like, are there architects in town who work on these things? And they recommended me. Uh, and from there, uh, restored that house. And then um, uh, the press on that project, uh, suddenly, I've, uh, as Jason mentioned, I'm kind of like the mid-century modern uh, renovator in town now. So we've been working on uh, a number of small projects and always both trying to be very respectful to those projects in terms of um, the original character of them, but of course they're incredibly outdated energy-wise. Um, kitchens are, are minimal, uh, bathrooms are even smaller. Uh, so the projects have always been uh, kind of transformative uh, in a number of ways for the houses. So they're, they're fun projects because you can kind of build on those existing spaces and the bones of those houses and also find ways of, um, I think, extending uh, uh, our own practice and our own interests. Sometimes, uh, like in this case, just the design of a new dining table, um, uh, but a restoration of this whole space uh, was part of it. Uh, and the table, working with the, uh, the client is actually the lawyer for Herman Miller. Uh, so there's a, a kind of really great um, supply of Herman Miller products, but we still convinced them to let us design the table. Uh, and we designed this table, which is actually, in these images, hard to see, but I'll show another version of it in just a minute, uh, that builds in a kind of relationship with uh, this particular chair, uh, uh, paired perfectly, basically using a, a robotically bent uh, wire frame that's a, uh, the table leg, and then using the router to manipulate the table to receive the leg in, in a uh, kind of inventive way. Um, a little bit washed out, but it, of the table, uh, both to give it a kind of structural stability, but we we're trying to find a way to kind of rethink some of that uh, mid-century language of the hairpin leg. And um, uh, th it's interesting that the, the folks who are buying these houses, you know, they, they typically are empty nesters who um, want to move to Ann Arbor to retire. They love the idea of the big, long, single floor that they can live on in the open space. Um, but they're coming from, you know, no knowledge whatsoever of what these houses mean architecturally or um, what their legacy is. And so they immediately are like buying every mid-century modern like atomic ranch and dwell and like, like pouring over those things and all they want you to do is more mid-century stuff. So we're trying to balance this kind of world of, of, um, uh, of kind of being part of that because we actually love the architecture. Plus there's a kind of great legacy of this work in Ann Arbor that we feel is worth preserving. Uh, and we still want to kind of find a way to, to engage them as a projected project moving forward. So, um, you know, we've developed a whole series of ways that we deal with updating the windows, of dealing with the energy systems, um, uh, of working with the floors, uh, of tweaking the kitchens um, uh, and bathrooms and, and finding a way to, to extend their life and make them kind of a, a significant because a lot of these houses are getting bought for their lots and then torn down. This one sits right on uh, a huge pond in Ann Arbor. Um, uh, a great view, so you can just begin to see the, the lake uh, right off the side of this one. Um, this porch was completely falling off, kind of rebuilding these things. And, and for me, this is, it, isn't a, it isn't a kind of, um, uh, it's both a kind of, I, I wanna <laughs> find a way to operate in these houses, but I'm also uh, pretty happy just to engage them on their own terms. Uh, and it, it parallels a number of things uh, that I've done at the university. We uh, right, right about the same time I was doing this, like I mentioned, I was using these houses as coursework uh, for the building systems class, uh, but also uh, coordinating the first year of the grad studios, uh, uh, the three-year program, uh, and re rewrote the curriculum for that to address um, each student basically as a, uh, draws out of a hat an iconic modern house as something to engage. And they, they do a kind of um, very uh, direct kind of engagement with it of, of drawing it, uh, modeling it, uh, analyzing it, uh, uh, diagramming it. But at the same time, they're also researching the architecture of, of that architect um, that's responsible for it. And they're responsible for articulating the position that, this that the particular house might have in the body of that architect's work, understanding it both as something that um, that didn't just like plop down, but actually comes through study and comes through work, uh, and then often leads to new things uh, later in their careers. 
And so the students are, are, are both trying to, uh, I think, trying to in, we're trying to introduce them to the, to the role of a project in a practice uh, and understand the, the kind of value of iterative research uh, that they engage when they take these on. So the first thing they do, again, is they, they simply um, document and analyze. The second thing, they do an addition inside. They have to make an alteration inside the architecture, which is always kind of fun. Uh, and the, uh, the last project is uh, actually to replace the house, but to replace the house today under today's terms using the same program and same site. So they, they essentially have to kind of, um, uh, they have to kind of kill their grandfather in a way to kind of make the project happen uh, and, and position the work relative to sort of contemporary issues that they've uh, engaged in terms of how they talk about the work and situate the work. Uh, so for these two houses, I mean, th these are two that, they, that they'll work with. Um, uh, a great pairing, uh, but also one that became a real fascinating subject for me. Um, because we, we learn and know these houses abstractly, I think, through our education. But I got the chance to visit both of them, and they were uh, they're incredible. They're like not quite what I learned. Uh, they are what I learned, but they were also something what may way, way more than that. And I got really fascinated with just starting to think about that conundrum of our abstract understanding of things and the distance between their realities. Uh, um, and, and something like these two houses um, launched, uh, um, uh, launched me into a set of investigations that um, uh, were very materially based, uh, similar to kind of things I was thinking about before, but also uh, both culturally and architecturally techniques in relationship to those uh, materials. Understanding, for instance, the kind of voyeurism of Johnson's house versus thinking of glass as a non-material in Nisa's work. Uh, for Johnson, it, I think it's very much about the glass itself as a property, as a set of effects that it can produce. And again, for Mies, I think it's, it's really about glass as something that is invisible. Uh, it's something that simply uh, allows you to have an, uh, a, a, an enclosure separation, but it's one that gets out of the way of your experience. Uh, so framing that landscape more by the white columns and the frame of the windows than by looking through glass. Uh, and for Johnson, it's about collapsing all of those layers of the landscape uh, and experience and uh, uh, immediate effects of the glass onto the surface and building a kind of collage. Um, uh, 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 so for Mies, I mean, Mies writes about that quite a bit, and Johnson, just using the way Johnson framed the project himself for his own publications, you can get that sensibility. Uh, this is a photograph. This is. Johnson sitting in his study with his back to us. The photographer Arnold Newman is outside, looking through the glass inside. That kind of perfect kind of expression of uh, a lot of the contradictions or conundrums of that house, but also setting up, I think, that kind of tension where uh, I think um, Johnson talked about this as his favorite photo of the house. Um, uh, and then you know, Mies and glass. Um, uh, when I mentioned earlier that we were trying to set up, uh, when we began the practice, a kind of project through competitions, I was very much thinking of the history of, of Mises' practice and beginning without commissions in Berlin and thinking about the brick country house, the concrete country house, the glass skyscrapers, uh, the later work with steel, as a way that he was, he was attempting to engage both the immediacy of technology and tectonics and materiality as a way to structure practice through projects. Um, and that these drawings, which I think are very different, his attitude toward the glass here is very different than in the, the, John, the, the Farnsworth house, where I think here glass is a very material presence. These drawings, if you've ever seen them, they're charcoal over a photograph. They're, uh, they're really rich and materially based. Um, and then there's the reality itself of the, of the Farnsworth house uh, and the tragedy of the flood, but I think also for me, Architecturally, uh, that flood represents an opportunity to rethink the house, both through the kind of radical shift of what happens when condensation hits that glass, uh, or when the receding uh, waters uh, leave and you get the mud from the river sitting on the travertine, which really is just mud from the Mediterranean excavated and brought and refined. And you get this kind of beautiful, I think, um, collapse of time and space and a kind of um, unintended contradiction of material properties that, that happen. I'm thinking about someone like uh, Hans Hock's work of the condensation cube as um, 
for me, I think like a, a, a beautiful allegory to where we have to be as architects, like we have to know so acutely our environments that we can design with them. Uh, that it's almost like magic, like that condensation cube which sits in the museum uh, and constantly produces condensation on the glass in that sealed container um, is kind of magical in that it does it always. But it's also, um, I think, uh, perfectly explained by him understanding the actual relative humidities and temperatures that the museum conditions insist on for the context of the art and then introducing a kind of contained body of water in that you get this happening uh, constantly uh, just because of the, the environment that the, the work sits in. Uh, and I think as architects that's, that's the story. Like we, we, we both have to understand conceptually the effect and the thing that we're after and I think we have to be magicians in terms of how to pull that off. Um, it's like, I always tell this to my students, it's like, it's a great idea to imagine that you're gonna make an elephant disappear, but it's the architect that figures out how to make it disappear. And, and that's the difference, I think, with just having the idea and figuring out how to execute it. Um, and I, I really think that's the kind of um, space that where, where the architect actually does the best work. <coughs> I'll speed up a, a little bit more. Um, this is the, the, the a project that Jason mentioned, the storm glass work, um, where coming off of some of the, uh, that, that last bit of um, uh, kind of work that I was doing in the school relative to, uh, I was completely um, uh, obsessed with the two glass houses. I was teaching the course called Building Systems, and in the Building Systems course, I was trying to teach, you know, the, the kind of basics, like how to use the psychrometric chart, understand the comfort zone, uh, r the relationship between humidity and temperature and how we have to design through those and do the calculations and all that. But instead of working toward the comfort zone, I, my assignment for the students was how do we produce fog? Like using that chart, you, you can actually, you, it's pretty easy. It's just as easy as finding the comfort zone, but the ability to kind of calibrate temperature and humidity to the moment where you would produce fog I think that, like, that's the kind of magic side of the thing and kind of more fun. The students really love that. If you, you ask them to find the comfort zone, they're like, uh, uh, and so it, it was kind of a way to start to think about, for me, weather rather than climate. Um, and I usually begin uh, the talk just on the storm glass with a Mark Tame quote, which was, um, climate is what we expect, weather is what you get. Uh, and for me, it's that distance, again, between the conceptual notion of what climate is, which is huge data sets that are um, calibrated in such a way they allow us to predict things to sometimes snow, sometimes maybe not snow. And then the, the reality of the weather, which is like it just snowed and uh, it's really slippery and uh, watch your step. Um, that those two things are radically different in our minds. Like, we know that Knoxville's gonna get a certain amount of snow every year, but the, that moment when it happens, it's, it's, a, it's a completely different engagement, I think, of ourselves in our, in our lives. And one that's it's about uncertainty, one that's about a, uh, a kind of connection with our environment and, and nature that um, uh, I think is important, uh, uh, and one that we need to acknowledge so I, I, was, uh, I, I came across this substance, it's called storm glass, uh, and it was invented in the uh, 18th century by the captain, uh, Admiral Fitzroy, who was the captain of Darwin's uh, boat, the Beagle. Uh, he was an amateur meteorologist, and the wooden cabinet here was actually a product that he sold uh, in England. Um, it's basically a, a weather cabinet, and it's got a whole bunch of different um, kind of really crude uh, weather measuring devices, and then the storm glass, which is a weather predicting device. Uh, and it's a crystalline, uh, a, a fluid solution, it looks like clear liquid. Uh, it often has crystals in it. Uh, and those crystals, uh, sometimes it's completely clear, it just depends on the weather and the patterns of weather. Uh, but it predicts about two days in advance any major change in weather through different formations of crystals. Uh, and apparently these were standard issue on every sailing vessel in the uh, 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 18th and early 19th century. They were just part of the, the thing, because if you were out in the middle of the ocean, you wanted to know about two days ahead if there was a major storm coming, uh, and they, they were just part of the thing. Uh, we found out that he published his formula um, uh, and a kind, of, um, uh, a kind of guide to reading the crystals, almost like reading the tea leaves, you know, at the, uh, to predict your future. Um, 
the formula made no sense to me. We worked with a chemist. The chemist deciphered the formula for us, basically gave us a recipe that we could decipher, uh, and we started cooking our own batches of this stuff. Um, and uh, uh, we, we basically were, we, we had a weather station. I bought a weather station, had it sitting outside, had the storm glass vial sitting in a window, uh, and we were calibrating every day uh, both the weather data and uh, matching that up with the, the kind of formations of the crystals. And some days they're really dense and feathery. Other days they look like snowflakes kind of suspended evenly through the stuff. Uh, and then other times, this was the craziest one, it was this, this crazy spiral that kind of went up through the tube. Um, uh, it, there was a major thunderstorm like uh, later, but it's the, the thing that I actually enjoyed about it, it was really, really hard to, to predict anything from it, <laughs> except that things were going to change. Like, you knew things were going to change. Because you could come in, and it would be radically different, and then in a couple days you would have cold and, and snow, uh, uh, and then it would kind of all disappear, and it would be clear for, for a bit. I mean, that, that was actually kind of great. And what I liked about that was that, like, it kind of, like, uh, made, for me, it was making fun of the data set, like the, the kind of data set of the climate thing and our weather apps on our phones. Because uh, I think, like, I mean, I, I do it every morning, like, what's the weather today? And I rely on that thing on my phone to tell me whether I need a sweater or a polar tech or a scarf or my flip-flops. Um, and I liked the kind of uh, the distancing that this had to that. Like, I, I couldn't actually, I couldn't use it really instrumentally. Um, because, I mean, I could read what it said today, but two days from now, I'm going to completely forget, you know. So I'm still using the weather app, but I liked the, the kind of recognition that, that something was happening out there, and it was registering and producing an aesthetic, actually, in the, in the surface. Uh, so we, we, we actually got a grant for this work. Um, uh, we started working. Uh, the, the chemist that we were talking to said, well, you know that we have a glass blower in the chemistry department. Like, no, that's kind of awesome. So we met Roy Wentz, who, who is the full-time glass blower for the chemistry and physics department at the University of Michigan. There's only four schools left, he was telling us, that have their own glass blowers. And basically what he does is he makes apparatuses for, the, um, for PhD students and the research scientists in their labs. So they need something that does a kind of spiral thing. So he's like a, a wizard with Pyrex. It's like unbelievable. And so we had him, we started experimenting, and basically he was making custom test tubes for us for the, for the project. Um, uh, and it was just fun to engage and kind of be there and kind of um, feel like you were in the presence of, of a craftsman who really knew his trade and was making something. Uh, uh, it was great. On a, on a side note, Jason mentioned my interest in geometry. And I'll, I'll just one, one thing about that. I, I did a, right about this time I was also doing a studio where I was a, um, teamed up with a history faculty who was teaching Baroque architecture, particularly Baroque mathematics and uh, vision and mathematics and Baroque architecture and looking uh, really closely at the, the geometric constructions uh, of um, Baroque architecture and making the students draw with a compass and a T-square, uh, basically the way that Borromini would have drawn. And I was like, well, that, that's nice, but come on. Uh, so we, we teamed up. I, I ran the studio based on uh, using digital tools to begin to think about how to produce this while she was having the, the exact same students were in her seminar and in my studio, and we took them to Rome. Uh, and, and for me, the fascination has always been with this kind of work. <coughs> like, um, that plan, like I can draw that plan from heart, like the geometry that produces it, the nested circles, the, the kind of, uh, the, uh, the breaking down of the geometry that locates new centers and then finds new arcs for radii and then produces that plan out of really simple, simple geometric uh, relationships. And then you go to that church and it's like, it's like, you're in like a, a jellyfish. The whole thing is just kind of like undulating and you, you feel like you've lost your bearings. Uh, the rigors of those geometries are completely suppressed in the experience of that space. And that distance for me was also like that distance between, for me, uh, just to make a big leap, but between the climate and the weather. Um, what we knew the thing was doing and what it actually did to us uh, were different things. So in the studio, We were using the, the same kind of software that we were using to produce the light fixtures, which allowed us to, uh, to work almost in an animated fashion. Um, using really sim I had them using really simple geometries. I actually gave them the, 
classic nine square grid problem, but they only had, um, they were only working on it in plan to, to begin with because it's a complicated software, uh, but they had to, to basically manipulate a kind of relationship of fluidity and stasis uh, that was hopefully producing something unique. So this is one of the drawings the students did, and it, it's really just nested circles that require, um, you fix the tangency, so you change the scale of one element, the whole thing uh, reconfigures itself. And those were the kind of things that we were trying to get at um, for as we, we uh, were developing the storm glass as a material uh, which sits perfectly in test tubes. How do you build something with test tubes? And we were looking at Johnson Wax, uh, Wright's uh, architecture there, which was using Pyrex tubes and a whole other array of things. But I was, uh, was th this kind of interest in geometry took us to a different, I think, uh, direction. And we started playing with how to get these kind of unexpected um, from simple geometries, very unexpected uh, shapes and, um, and surfaces developing. We, the, this is in our office. We built a, a small um, a window screen, uh, and, and this is what we were actually tracking for about a year and a half. Uh, and using a, uh, you know, the window screen allows us to think about the surface, the, the tubes think about the surface as a ruled surface rather than a, a kind of blobby thing. Um, because I'm, I'm pretty insistent on uh, understanding the, the, like how to construct the geometry, not just how to produce it, but, but literally how to construct it. Um, and, uh, and then learning from simple things like um, we did a lot of research into lashing techniques, like how to build a bamboo fence uh, uh, was one of the things we were looking at in terms of how to put the, the tubes together. Um, and developed a whole uh, a set of techniques for, for binding and, and collecting the tubes. Uh, we built a large piece in the office uh, and then did an installation at the school um, uh, of this with the surface. And then uh, as we were kind of getting toward the end of this, um, a commission that we'd had came back online for a weekend house uh, uh, and we, we basically took on the project of applying this work to that project. Um, so in, in this plan, all of the white stuff is, is basically storm glass. So every window was reconsidered through the storm glass, but the windows were much like the, uh, we were trying to build on the, the idea of the glass house, but not make a full glass house. So the, the, the windows that we did produce basically are drawn into the space to make the interior walls. Because in the end, the, 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 um, you can see the kind of distortion and almost opaque-like surface that begins to develop when, when you get that array of rods. It lets light through, but really no visual um, transmittance. So we thought like it'd be a pretty interesting way to begin to think about the development of that interior, uh, but tie it to that exterior. And then had a few moments where we framed the landscape because the clients were pretty insistent that like, no, we, we really like the site. Uh, <laughs> And then in the development of that project using the same software sets and, and finding ways of, of building a rigor to the geometry. In this case, each of the major rooms is, is a fragment of a torqued ellipse, uh, but we set the perimeter in relationship to the torquing of the ellipse with a, a parameter that allowed always that to be an extruded straight line. And then when the, as soon as that uh, ellipse becomes an interior surface, it can then wobble uh, or distort or warp into place. Uh, but at the moment of exterior, it's actually perfectly vertical, so we can tie it to the, to the rest of the architecture. Uh, and the final plan, this is the final plan, which w ultimately w made a courtyard uh, in the interior uh, with a set of glass, uh, storm glass that was perfectly vertical and closed so that we could get a tight seal between the, between the tubes. Uh, and then the interior one, which is based on the torqued ellipse, which is... Um, because it's ruled surface and the ellipse is torquing, there's always space between each rod, so it's a kind of porous one. And then we were feeding the, um, the heating and cooling system basically in that cavity between the two, so it was basically just kind of dispersing into the room uh, through the storm glass. Uh, there's a couple of images. And then a final-ish project, um, a restaurant, which... Uh, coming back now, uh, I just got a, a commission for a restaurant. We just finished this about a year ago, um, a much bigger scale, and allowed us to think, I think, in very different ways, both in terms of our sophistication with the tools and the materials and detailing, um, and a better budget uh, uh, to produce, uh, I think, a, 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 
for me, a much more satisfying space because I wasn't so much, this project suddenly became not about the tool for me anymore. It was becoming more about the, uh, about the, the space that we were making and the tools simply came along for the ride as something we deployed, much like we made the decision to use a table saw on this cut versus a router on that cut. The tools were something that we were, uh, they were simply facilitating our ability to think spatially now. Um, I'll just show you a few of the pieces. We are working also now, um, I think, getting much smarter about working with good fabricators. Because um, they all, all the fabricators in Ann Arbor area now have this equipment. They're, they're using, uh, pretty much everything is being produced digitally. Every, every mill workshop now has a CNC mill. All the steel shops are using uh, laser cutters and digital plasma cutters uh, uh, and CNC bending machines. Uh, so we started to, to kind of just engage those guys uh, a bit more, uh, designing, you can't see anything, um, uh, we can't see much, uh, kind of details of folded steel in order to make a banquette, uh, and thinking about, for instance, the height of something uh, relative to how it made space. Um, uh, an entire wall, that's a, a kind of steel uh, shelving system that we developed. Uh, a wall in the back, which I think is more kind of in, uh, akin to the kind of early work of really cheap stuff, kind of worked to an inch of its life. Um, it's the shelving system. Or an entry screen, which is a, a hybrid of, a, of wood uh, uh, components that we were making on the mill, uh, and um, uh, a welded steel screen, uh, which becomes a coat rack and an entry screen simultaneously. So the wood kind of bends out, it kind of thins out as it goes up. Uh, and layers of it start to bend out. Uh, the rods continue all the way up to the ceiling to a wall that we now considered a light fixture um, and just literally two by fours that um, weren't CNC. We did them on a chop saw. Uh, we then built a jig for the CNC to make a series of holes that then allowed us to thread them down rebar uh, uh, and produce a wall that is both backlit and frontlit. And throughout the course of the day, we changed the calibration of that lighting to match the exterior lighting through a digital program that um, was basically sensing light levels uh, and kind of uh, building a, a kind of morning atmosphere where it's very casual to an evening uh, dinner atmosphere, which feels more formal to a kind of darker kind of late night atmosphere uh, for after dinner. Uh, and really just, uh, it's, a, it's two by four bricks. Uh, they're spaced uh, slightly apart so that the light comes through. So the mortar joints are essentially the kind of apertures for light. Uh, the wall undulates, uh, and that undulation allows us to get more light in certain areas and less in other areas. Um, uh, is every brick is the same. Like we, we kind of, uh, I, was, I was getting more interested in the kind of rigor of efficiency and letting geometry do some of the work for us, rather than every part being unique, and then having to label and track each one of them, uh, particularly something that, that big. Um, Simple spatial moves, which had to do with the way we were dealing with the wall and mirrors and lighting uh, in this in relation to the bathrooms. The inside wall of the bathroom and the outside are, are the exact same pattern. And then the two sides, the men's and women's, actually are symmetrically oriented. So when the mirror that divides the men's and women's bisects the, the kind of hallway wall, the, the pattern of it just uh, moves right through and, and it makes it feel as though the room is, is kind of whole uh, with sinks simply shared in the middle, which was our original idea, but the building inspector wouldn't let us do it. Uh, so we tricked him. We only made the separation eight feet. The room is 11 feet. So you literally could throw paper towels over the other side. But we also were after that kind of game between the two sides. So the, the guy you're seeing opening the door there is actually behind me. Uh, I'm taking the photograph. Um, but it appears as though he's just on the other side of the sink. Those doors are also 11 feet tall to keep that wall kind of free. Uh, as its own element, um, and the, the kind of final space. Um, um, I'll, I'll show really quickly two other projects. Is there, the, for me, it's like trying to get back to that other scale, sort of working back up. Uh, and this one is a, a recreation center that um, we're hopefully, um, we'll find out within the next week whether we have this or not. Uh, the project is at the intersection of a, a 19th century commercial street uh, and a park system designed by the Olmsteads um, uh, that runs along a river uh, and that river is now part of a border-to-border -border trail system that the county park system uh, is operating 
uh, and they asked us to incorporate all of those things into the mix of the project. And given our site, which is uh, on this commercial strip, but also in the park system, uh, the, the strategy for us was to think of a way that both presents to the street, but also thinks of the recreation center as a landscape. So there's a, a kind of recreational topography of a gymnasium and a pool, and then a roof canopy, uh, like a tent in the park that floats up above it and holds um, a couple of classrooms and a running track um, within the depth of structure that's spanning over the two other pieces. Uh, um, uh, the network of the, the, of the site is kind of interesting. So the red lines is the kind of recreational trail and then the yellow or orangish lines are the kind of commercial um, and uh, an automobile kind of orientation. And so we ended up with the, the possibility of a number, there was no back door to the building. Every side felt like a front um, and how to, how to resolve that. So part of that was the kind of landscape idea and making it a kind of porous architecture that the, that the roof simply hovers above. Um, and working with a kind of, um, uh, a kind of attitude about that transparency and thinking of the, the structure as a new gateway to the park rather than as a uh, kind of part of an extension of the commercial strip. Uh, that interior, and you get a sense of this is the entry lobby of that kind of horizontal openness and the, the swimming pools, the gymnasium, and you could see the kind of the depth of structure for the span that we have was also uh, deep enough that we could embed program in the, the space of that span, trying to build a kind of efficiency out of the, the logic of the structure. Um, a couple of the models. This shot, I think you can really begin to see that kind of idea of the horizontal openness uh, of the project. This was a, a kind of structural diagram that we produced uh, with the structural engineer the way that it, that that open topography also follows the site it kind of dips uh, in relationship to the topography um, as though the roof kind of peels up above it um, see that here and then just uh, two images of a, um, a recent we're, we're still good at second place this is a second place entry for a um, competition we just finished in China for an office tower uh, in Shenzhen uh, and, and in this one, it, it really the, the game has kind of shifted toward that question of integration. So thinking about structure, thinking about enclosure, uh, mm -hmm. thinking about various types of windows within the kind of generic box that these projects present. And also trying to think um, a little bit sculpturally about the disposition of this project in terms of views. There's, there are a couple of uh, interestingly corridors of views, one toward mountains uh, on one side of the building and the other to a harbor on the other, but then there's a number of towers that are also blocking views. So we were uh, thinking about really specific windows uh, in terms of articulating hierarchy uh, to the interior of the, the office landscape. Um, see that here. Uh, and then, uh, as Jason mentioned, beginning to think about a, a, a kind of large scale um, uh, uh, planning projects through the same process. Um, and then the last, the last image, uh, three images is a table that we designed. Um, uh, four images, maybe, maybe five. <laughs> uh, a table we designed uh, just recently, which I think kind of ties together some of those early interests. So now uh, the legs, these are, uh, it's very similar to that table I mentioned before, kind of reinventing this idea of the hairpin uh, and using a robot actually to do precise bending in order to get uh, uh, very good repetition. The slab of the table uh, is, is completely milled uh, as a surface and engages the leg kind of embedded into the side, which actually stabilizes the structure. So there's no mechanical connection there, just at the point at the bottom where the, uh, the four uh, hit the bottom side of the surface of the table and we routed a pocket into that table. Once we were routing there, um, uh, it gave us the opportunity to begin to think about that surface as something to be developed. Uh, and in this case, really a decorative surface, um, which is a, a, a really simple pattern that emerges from the four corners, uh, basically radiating uh, circles out from that and just letting them intersect completely across the whole surface in order to get a kind of textural quality so that when you, you're sitting at the table or you pull yourself forward to the table, you feel that underside in, in relationship to uh, the kind of experience of it. And then, uh, uh, we, actually, uh, we with the client, we selected the, the chairs. These are David Ajay's skin chairs. Um, uh, 
uh, which are really smooth kind of uh, surface on the top and the, the parts that you sit on and, and kind of touch directly. But that underside, when you go to grab and pull it under, you feel the kind of structural framing of that chair exposed on the bottom. And uh, so we were trying to build a kind of symbiosis between uh, a chair that was given to us and, a, um, and the design of the table. So that, that story, I think, um, for me, I don't know, I'm still trying to make kind of sense of how to tie projects together in a bigger narrative, but I feel like it does kind of move in this kind of scalar kind of game between medium to super small to getting bigger to maybe too big to um, back to a kind of um, thing that we can engage and touch. Um, and I should say also that the, there's a lot of people involved in all of that work I just showed. A lot of them in the room today, a couple people sitting at the table here. Um, a uh, recent grad from uh, uh, the undergrad program here, Andy Schaefer-Coder, as well as Jen and Maria, who um, lectured last night at the architecture school, uh, have, have been part of a number of the projects that we've collaborated on quite a bit, plus a, a, a long list of, of folks that I think have contributed enormously. But many times I just feel like uh, I'm just the kind of support for uh, a system um, of production that, that has its own life. Um, I've been pretty lucky in that regard. So uh, I went a bit long, maybe, but uh, any questions? I'm happy to ask questions, answer questions. If anyone has any? Thank you so much for for being so talented. First of all, and. Uh, <laughs> And for second of all, to, uh, to take time and take the trip to Knoxville, Tennessee to share that with us. So we, we just really appreciate it. Thank you. And thanks again to our sponsors and for all of you for attending. And be safe going home. Thanks. <laughs>